Today I want to talk about something a little special, something somewhat elusive, mysterious, dare I say, a dichotomy of sorts. Yes, of course, I am talking about the elusive INFJ. What is an INFJ? If you don't know, it's one of the 16 personality types from Myers-Briggs. They say it is one of the more uh, rare ones, maybe one to 2% of the population. And amongst men, apparently, it's even more rare, maybe half that many people. So it might be, you know, half a percent to 1% of all men might end up an INFJ. You know, I've been thinking about making this video for about a year. I never really quite get to it. And it's funny because I think maybe I don't know enough about it. I feel like this stress that I haven't mastered this topic yet. So maybe I'm not qualified to talk about it. But the reality is I think the reason why you can't master it is it's confusing and it's huge. And let's be honest, it's a model to explain behavior. A lot of people get really obsessed with this INFJ stuff and they take it almost like biblical truth and they almost start to, this is the thing that kind of annoys me about it a little bit. They almost start to preemptively change their behavior to match the personality type. They're like, oh, INFJs are supposed to act like this. Therefore, in this situation, I can be that. And a lot of times it almost ends up as a bit of an excuse for poor behavior is what I've noticed. For me, I don't want it to be that. I want it to be more an explanation of why I think certain ways or why I've behaved certain ways in the past or explanations about why certain things rub me the wrong way. Why do I get that sandpaper feeling in certain situations where other people are totally fine? Maybe why do I interact with people the way I do? Why do I react to people in good ways or poor ways when they act a certain way? Why do other people react to me in such shocked ways a lot of the time? So I'll start with a bit of a, just a quick recap of my life, I guess, and sort of how I grew up and how I stumbled into this and why it even matters at all to know that I'm this INFJ. So I grew up in a fairly well-off family, I guess, you know, upper middle class, you could say. And my parents raised me, you know, the best they knew how at the time. But, you know, I think the reality is, is that I was a different kind of person. I, I never really fit into anything super easily or super well. A lot of things didn't make sense to me, especially a lot of culture and why I had to do certain things. So my sister is actually, you know, very different than me in a lot of ways, you know, extroverted and being an introverted person at the time, I didn't even know what introverted meant, but I just knew that I was different than that. And I, everybody just thought I was shy, I guess you could say. And that continued all the way up into elementary, up into high school. I was a fairly shy person. I got away with a lot of things because I was good at stuff, I guess. I mean, I was good at sports. I was good at music. I played a lot of drums and played a lot of bands, played guitar. Um, and I was also good at academic stuff. So I was good at school. So I kind of sort of found my places in those things. Um, but as for relationships, I always had very few f friends. And I guess it depends how you define a friend, right? By my definition of friend, which I feel like is a lot more robust than most people's definition of friends, I might have only had a few friends at any given time. Uh, I had one really good friend. We met when we were about 13. He's, I figured out, is an INTJ and hanging out, talking, philosophizing. We got really sarcastic. I remember both of us turned into these very sarcastic, almost cynical people, just making fun of everything because the world, to be honest, didn't make a lot of sense to us. And uh, we were just kind of trying to make our way through it. So in my 20s, I remember I got my first job at Electronic Arts as a software engineer, uh, basically a game programmer. I had my degree in computer science, got this job. I remember they stuck me in this pod. Basically, I was on a team of maybe 15 to 20 programmers. We're all programming this certain thing. And we were just like all kind of in these pods with four people all in this square, kind of your desk, their desk. And um, I remember very quickly how uncomfortable I was in that situation. I couldn't work when with all this noise around me people talking and distracting me. And I think I actually am and was a very good programmer. Um, but I find once I get, it takes me a bit to get into that zone. And then once I'm in it, it's just like things are happening. The work is going. And if somebody comes along and kind of knocks me out of that zone, you know, 
it can take me 20 minutes to get back into it. And so I, that was the first time I really started to notice that I was a, I worked a little different than all these people, a lot of these other people. And they would talk a lot and work, talk and work. Hey, let's get three of us around a computer and talk and work. That's just not how I worked. And eventually they figured that out, me and this other guy. And they stuck me off, or they stuck us off in the corner together on this sort of two-person uh, pod. But uh, we had this nice corner window. It was nice and quiet. And anyway, the two of us sat over there and got like tons of work done. And the other thing that I noticed was sometimes it took me a little bit of time to think about a problem. But once I had that time to think about it, I'd often come to the solution. And the thing that sucked about school, I always thought, was... They make you answer the question like that. And you don't have any time to sort of soak in that, that problem. So the thing about computer science and math, it's like these really hard problems. And it's like, you're supposed to know the answer instantly. And I just never really was very good at that. I might need half an hour, go drink some water, sit on a couch. It looks like you're not working, but you're actually thinking about a problem. And then it comes to you. Or sometimes I've had problems come to me in the middle of the night. Or I wake up in the morning and brush my teeth, all of a sudden the solution to the problem comes to me. And I was, I was always perplexed by that. Like, where is that coming from? Where, what process inside my mind is answering questions even when I'm not thinking about it? So more about that later. So into my mid-twenties, I discovered this book. I remember when I found it, it was called The Introvert Advantage. And I had never really thought about the term introvert before and what that even meant. And I thought maybe like everybody, introverted means like shy or socially awkward. And so nobody really wanted to be an introvert. Um, but anyway, I read the book and it kind of just blew my mind. I was this introvert and this makes sense. All of a sudden my whole life made sense. It's funny. I almost feel, I feel really jealous of people that are growing up right now because all this information is available to you. It's like, I think, I mean, like psychology seems more prevalent in culture right now. And, you know, young people might know they're an introvert and they actually know, oh yeah, I need alone time. I need to work by myself. I can't just work with everybody and brainstorm constantly and work in this group really well. So I'm, I'm kind of jealous of, of people that know that growing up because I think I lost a lot of confidence as I was growing up not knowing what it meant to be introverted because, you know, I've learned how to be, appear more extroverted over time and I've learned how to work in groups and do sales and I own an online business now that does a lot of phone and email sales and so I've learned how to project myself and to sell things and to sound excited and extroverted towards people. Um, but I feel like that was a learned behavior for me. It was never something that was just innate. And so as I went on, I th at first I thought, oh, introvert must be super rare because I feel rare. I feel like I don't fit in very well. And I slowly started to realize that there's a lot more introverts than I thought. Ah, there's lots of other introverts around here. And all of us introverts are like kind of confused. We're trying to fit into this extroverted world. Everything is designed for extroverts. It seems like work, you know, even those, when I worked for EA, those pods with the four p people working in these things, it's just not an introvert work environment. Um, school, same thing. Um, a lot of times you're forced to work in groups or teams. And, and, you know, in a real work environment, it's important to learn those things. So maybe it's good. Like when I worked at EA, you're not just one person programming a game in a basement. It's not like 1980 anymore when one person could make a game. Uh, you know, it takes a team of 50 to 100 people a whole year of working super hard to make those games. So you've got to learn to work with people, right? So it's kind of part of the process. All right, so fast forward a few more years. I was in my 30s now, maybe early 30s, maybe 30, 31, something like that. And I met this friend and it was weird because we seemed to be able to understand each other on a level that maybe most people couldn't understand. Like she got certain things about me that maybe nobody had really got before. And I, I found that perplexing and a little confusing. And she's like, hey, take this personality test. I'm like, okay. So I took it. I got the INFJ. I think it was the 16 personalities one. Um, I did it again later, still got INFJ. I did a couple other ones, sort of got INFJ in all of these tests. And so it turns out she was INFJ as well. So I started learning about what does this mean? 
and I started going into it and just reading the description on that 16 personalities at the very beginning, it was another one of those mind blowing experiences is like, what in the world this is describing me to such a deep, intimate level that I, I almost, I, I couldn't believe it. And so it's funny, they had an ebook that you could buy for like $30. I'm like, for sure buying that. So I bought the ebook, read the whole thing. In the ebook, I think near the end, it said, who's the most likely personality to buy the ebook? And guess what, INFJ. Even after reading that, I still wanted to know more. So I just kept researching and reading. I watched YouTube videos. Eventually, I discovered this guy, C.S. Joseph. And he's kind of interesting because he was taking it a little bit deeper than just the the letters. So it's like I, oh, I'm introverted instead of extroverted. N, oh, I'm intuitive instead of sensing. And I was always trying to be like, oh no, I'm not sensing, I'm intuitive. And then I, we got to the F and the T and that was the thing that never quite made sense to me because it feels like I do a lot of thinking. I definitely know that I get into like, I overthink a lot. And that was the thing I was always a little confused about. How can I be an F if I do so much thinking? And so he was the first guy that kind of explained the cognitive functions to me. And there's a bunch of other resources on that as well. So, and the reason why I like the cognitive function explanation of these personalities is because it goes beyond just being, oh, are you a thinker or a feeler? So with INFJ, the dominant function is introverted intuition. But then second is extroverted feeling. And so that's where the F comes from because that's our second cognitive function in the stack. And lo and behold, the third thing is introverted thinking. And so the funny thing is, we're kind of F and T at the same time. And that's why I like the cognitive functions that explained that to me. Because I was like, well, how can I be an F when I feel like a T sometimes? Sometimes when I'm tired, I seem to go more into T mode. And when I'm feeling good and I'm not stressed and I'm happy, I feel more F. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Uh, that explained that. So you've got this cognitive function stack where these four top things and each one sort of has a place and an explanation. So if, if the first thing is introverted intuition, that means that's your dominant function uh, as the personality. So in INFJ, the dominant function is introverted intuition. All right, so let's start off with sort of my core values of how I operate. The reason why I've never quite fit in with society, with culture, with the community at large is that basically tradition and anything where a group of people is telling you what you should do really doesn't resonate with me. I really dislike that. If somebody is telling me what to do and I don't have a choice in the matter, I can I can really shut off really quick. And here's the problem. It has to make sense. So if somebody's telling me what to do and it makes sense to me, then I got no problem doing that. If you're an INFJ and you're under some kind of leader, a good leader is really important. If they're doing illogical things that don't make sense, and as an INFJ, that's just not gonna work. Like if people are telling you to do things just because that's what you're supposed to do or duty-based, duty-based is the worst. I don't know, I just, I just don't operate well in that environment. It has to make sense to me before I can really get on board with it. I feel like authenticity is one of the most important things to me and at the end of the day, you have to be yourself. You have to be true to yourself. You know, recently somebody asked me like, what are your values? And I think what they were trying to say is they wanted me to sort of adhere to some moral code. But the reality is, what are my values? I think one of the most important things to me is authenticity. And it's, it's not hiding things and it's not doing things that don't make sense. It's being who you are. And sometimes that means not being very popular. And that's been a really hard thing for me as I've grown older. So, you know, when I was in high school, the problem is when you look out and you see a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense, but you're not in a place to trust yourself, what do you do? You get low self-confidence and you think, oh, I must be wrong, which is a bit of a tragedy. And I feel like young INFJs or, you know, there's probably other personalities as well. Uh, INTJs also have dominant uh, introverted intuition. And intuition kind of gives you this feeling of the path you should follow, the thing that makes sense, the goal you should be working towards. 
And, and the problem is if culture is telling you something that doesn't align with what you think makes sense, it can get really confusing. And so in that situation, you have this choice to trust your intuition or you have a choice to trust other people over yourself. And I think that's what I did. Basically, high school, all the way through my 20s, I had low self-confidence because my intuition and my brain and thoughts were telling me certain things, but I couldn't quite trust it because it was so countercultural. So when I kind of found this INFJ stuff, I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing because it kind of explains, oh yeah, we don't really like culture. We don't like people giving us should do's. We don't really like bureaucracy and rules for the sake of rules. Just hate that. Um, and we don't really like, you know, hierarchies either. Like I have an employee in my business. I feel like I don't really want to be that person that's like overlording over somebody. In a way, I'd like to work together with people and treat them as equals. I don't really like this attitude of I'm the boss, you're the employee, do what I say. I, I want people to understand the reasons because I want to know the reasons. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a million things I could talk about here. I feel like I could just keep going on and on. Probably already going overboard. So let's jump into the four cognitive functions because I feel like that will explain some things. All right, first cognitive function of the INFJ. And I feel like this makes so much sense to me. And when I figured this out, it was just mind blowing because it made so much sense. Introverted intuition. And so what is introverted intuition? I feel like introverted intuition is almost like the ability to see through the noise and make decisions and push towards goals and to see things clearly. It's almost like this laser focus in on something. It's all these puzzle pieces are being thrown at you. You can put them all together and you see the thing. And a lot of people might not see it and they're, they don't even know what you're talking about half the time. And I think that's part of the problem is I, it's like I sit there and listen, I listen, I listen, I observe, I see, I research, and then all of a sudden these things hit me. And it, uh, introverted intuition is also about planning and goals. And basically, it, it helped, it's like, I want to do this, and you can make a plan to move forward through the noise. And so wanting to do something, desiring something, that's all part of intuition as well, introverted intuition. Extroverted intuition is a little bit different in that you sort of, uh, these people see all the possibilities. And I think maybe almost sometimes these people get a little bit overwhelmed because there's so many possibilities that they have trouble choosing one. But introverted intuition is a little different. And I probably, I got this from C.S. Joseph, I think. But it sort of gives you this laser focus. And that's why um, INFJs, we might be sometimes a little slow to start things because we're thinking, we're absorbing all this information. What should we be doing? What do we want to do? What we want to do is really important. Um, but when we actually figure it out and then we find that thing and then we put the blinders on and we push through to reach that goal, we can actually be incredibly hard workers. And I've seen that multiple times in my life. You know, I can just be like turned off of things. I feel lazy. I'm not into it. Then all of a sudden I pick up a project or I think of something and I, or there's some catalyst to realizing I really need to do something. Like when I started my online business, I started it and then I, I just, I started working and then I just didn't stop until it was successful essentially. So another thing about introverted intuition is it can almost seem like luck to certain people. And I actually had somebody say this to me once. It seems like, it seems like everything you touch just turns to gold. And I was like, that's a weird thing to say because I've failed lots and there's lots of things I would like to do. And it seems like lots, lots of things don't work. But that's a funny thing to say because I think introverted intuition sometimes comes across as luck because it's like, oh, you happen to choose the right path and it worked out. But really, I think that's what introverted intuition is about. It's about seeing the path forward and following it. And the problem is when people like teachers or bosses or other people in authority, you know, parents come up and tell us that we're on the wrong path or that we shouldn't be doing that. And then they give us these reasons why that to us just are stupid or don't make sense. That, that creates a problem. And I think that's why sometimes introverted intuition 
can get us into trouble. Because the other problem with intuition is, is it's, it's almost like you know what you got to do. You know why you want to, you just know you want to do this. You know this is the thing that has to happen. But you can't really explain it very well. And uh, you sort of sound like a bit of a bumbling idiot sometimes when you try to explain your intuition. So something I heard from C.S. Joseph about the introverted intuition that made a lot of sense was um, the less introverted intuition you have in your personality, the more duty-based functions actually make sense. So if you're the type of person that just loves bureaucracy and everybody telling you what to do and or religion and it gives you this, it sort of hands you a moral code, follow this, this, and this. Don't ask us why. This is just the way it is. So if you're the type of person that really accepts that, and there's a lot of people that really like that, they value tradition. This is the way we've always done it. Therefore, it probably is, is right. You should listen to us. So the more introverted intuition you have, the less you care about tradition and the way things have been done for a long time. It's just, it just, it's, it's really hard to emphasize how much sometimes it doesn't matter. And when somebody comes at you with that, it is so frustrating. So I'll give you one example. I'm also a photographer and filmmaker. So I make documentary films. Um, I also do a lot of photography, artistic photography. And sometimes I'll do sort of photography that kind of pushes some boundaries, especially, you know, in the amongst maybe my Christian friends. Maybe people aren't wearing enough clothing to, for these people to feel totally comfortable. And they tell me this. They're like, you shouldn't be doing that. And then... The problem is, is that that doesn't make sense to me. A lot of the views on, you know, what is appropriate for people to do are based on these arbitrary lines in the sand that uh, have been drawn by culture and they're slowly pushed over time. But there's no real reason behind a lot of these things. And so I have a really hard time when people tell me that I shouldn't do something because of some cultural norm. It really, really gets to me. Okay, second cognitive function, and I feel like this is also vitally important for the INFJ, extroverted feeling. And this is just sort of a bizarre combination in a lot of ways, because we got introverted intuition. The third thing we got is introverted thinking. So we got all this introverted activity going on inside of us, and then throw some extroverted feeling into the mix. And so the extroverted feeling is really how we gather a lot of information. So the fourth function in the stack, which is actually the inferior function, is extroverted sensing. So extroverted sensing and extroverted feeling are the two ways that INFJs bring in new information. And extroverted feeling is an interesting thing because it basically means you're absorbing other people's feelings. And that's really what it is. So you walk into a room, and I've always noticed this, and I actually noticed this growing up. So my mom and sister were fairly emotional people. And I feel like when I'd walk into the house, right, it was like, well, how's everybody feeling right now? And the mood would immediately be transferred to me. So if one of my really good friends is feeling down and bad, it almost can, it just sort of comes on to me and I sort of take that on. And it's something that's always been quite confusing to me. The other thing about having strong extroverted feeling is it's like, it's almost like you have trouble knowing how you are feeling. That's how I feel. Anyway. I don't know if other people feel that way. It's like, how do I feel? I'm actually not even sure, but I sure know that person feels this way and this person feels this way and I want to help. And it sort of like creates this thing, you want to please people. And so part of the problem with INFJs is we can become people pleasers because of that. We're sitting here trying to please people to make them feel good. And why do we want to do that? Because then it makes us feel good because we're absorbing their emotions. So we can become people pleasers. And so the introverted intuition and the extroverted feeling together, you know, if you trust your intuition as an INFJ, you know, that can be your dominant function. You won't people please to the point of degrading yourself. But let's say you don't trust yourself, as I didn't, you know, high school all the way through my 20s. You don't even trust yourself now. So your introverted intuition is weak and you're like, no, I don't, I'm not trusting that. What's the next thing? Extroverted feeling. And so you start doing all the things that people want you to do to make them feel good. So all of a sudden, you know, you're doing all this stuff to please your parents. You know, maybe your parents want to do a bunch of things and you don't really want to, but no, all that matters is pleasing them, pleasing your teachers. You know, I've, I've had situations in my life where I feel like people have taken advantage of me because they start to realize that I want to help. I really do want to help. 
um, charitable organizations is, is a perfect example. There was a time in my life where I'm just, I was just giving and giving and I'm making stuff, videos, and I was doing all this work for them. And then, but I wasn't really getting anything in return. Um, other, I just felt used is what I should say. I didn't feel appreciated. And I think that's part of the thing about extroverted feeling. If you do things for people, you, it's almost like you require some recognition and reassurance. And so I think as INFJs, that's important to us. We need to be reassured now and then. I feel that. Maybe I shouldn't talk about INFJs in general. I talk about myself. I feel like I don't need a lot of it, but I really like to be reassured now and then, especially in my relationships. Like if somebody doesn't reassure me, things can start to go downhill. I just start to assume that they're not happy with me. And once, you know, once I assume they're not happy with me, that makes me feel bad. And eventually maybe I'll just shut right down and uh, get out of that situation. And, and that's, that's kind of dangerous because, you know, you can take a lot. You take a lot of abuse with extroverted feeling. You're, you're helping. You're, you want to help people. You're taking on their feelings. You're trying. You're trying. You're trying. And then all of a sudden you're like, you reach overload and you're like, I'm out of here. And uh, you leave. And it's like uh, just immediate cutoff. And they have a word for it, INFJ door slam. I don't know if the door slam has only to do with extroverted feeling, but it's probably part of it. But, you know, when that door slam happens, you're like, I mean, I've done that to people. It's sort of like, I'm done. I got to get out of here. Like, I'm not seeing any changes out of you. There's no way this is working and you leave. But the problem is, is other people see it as a very sudden thing because you're trying, you're trying, you're working at it, you're investing, investing into a person, then they just get complacent. And then all of a sudden, you're just like poof, hot, hot to cold. And they're like, whoa, what happened? And then they're all hurt. And you know, rightfully so. So the advantage of extroverted feeling though, is you can end up a very caring, helpful person. And if you actually end up in a situation where you feel valued and you're contributing and you're making a difference, all of a sudden INFJs can be really fulfilled. Because I think that's really what what do we want at our core? We want to feel valuable. I know I I want to feel valuable. I want to feel listened to. I want to feel heard. I want to feel like I'm contributing and it's making a difference and it's helping somebody, helping people. Um, I think it's very people focused. You, you have all these grand visions. And the thing about introverted intuition is you sort of see problems and you see the way that we should all be going. And if you can actually wrangle all the people together and push them all in that direction and make a difference in people's lives, that can be quite fulfilling, I think. And I think that maybe that should be something that INFJs try to do. Otherwise, if you do things where you're not helping people, nobody's valuing, maybe even say you're damaging people, it's going to affect you and you're not going to be healthy, I think, with that extroverted feeling. It's just it needs that external input and it needs positive external input uh, in the form of people, people's feelings. So that's extroverted feeling third cognitive function in the INFJ stack and this is the child function the third thing is always the child um, is the introverted thinking so the interesting thing about the child function is it's sort of the most pure or innocent or childlike and so when you put introverted thinking into the child position you end up with really innocent thinking well, and what is that that is basically logic so introverted thinking in the child position, that's what INFJs have. It's basically pure, unfiltered logic. So that's why INFJs can come across sometimes as really deep thinkers, um, because we're combining the introverted intuition, we're bringing feelings in through the extroverted feeling, we're reading people, and then we're using our minds to actually filter that and think about it. And so the interesting thing about introverted thinking is it doesn't really take into consideration very much external thoughts. And what I mean by that is other people's opinions, other people's thoughts. That's the one weakness of introverted thinking is let's say there's a whole bunch of research that says this, this, and that. But in your mind, it just doesn't make logical sense. You'll just throw all that out and trust the logic of it. 
Um, whereas extroverted thinking, uh, the INTJ has extroverted thinking actually. And that's basically more like rationale about the collective opinion. So like all of these experts have said this, this, and this for these reasons. And that makes, that makes sense to an extroverted thinker. They kind of put this together and um, they can form their thoughts around that. Um, whereas introverted thinking, it is a little different. It is just pure logic. And I think, you know, computer science and programming is a very logical activity. It's just pure logic when you're actually programming. You're just basically telling a computer what to do and you're doing a lot of math and things that are just very sequential and there's a lot of order to it. And I think doing all that programming really developed my introverted thinking. And so I've noticed that some INFJs are really good at their introverted thinking, but some aren't. It's almost like they don't trust their thinking or, uh, I don't know, it hasn't been developed maybe the same way. Because the more you do something, uh, the more it's developed. But if you're an INFJ that maybe hasn't developed their introverted thinking, I think you could really benefit from that. I'm often that person now that's just like, that doesn't make sense. Or you said this a minute ago, now you're saying this. Logic basically can pick up on contradictions. And so a minute ago you said something and now you're saying something different. And the whole picking up contradiction thing is quite frustrating for me. And it's almost ruling my life at this point lately. It just feels like people are saying all kinds of stuff and they're contradicting themselves. And then you ask them why this, and then they throw out defenses, and then the defenses don't really line up with the original thing. And it's just, and then you attack the defense. And anyway, it just turns into this big confusing thing. And people hate it when you point out flaws in their logic. It's this catch-22. Well, do you point it out and point out that doesn't make sense? Or do you just keep it inside? And so that's part of the problem, I think, with introverted thinking is you can end up in a kind of a bit of a lonely place because you're just like, if you're around a bunch of people that don't value logic, you can get really frustrated really quick. And I think it really helps to be around some, some smart people. Actually, my, some of my favorite people to be around are INTJs. So my best friend from growing up, INTJ. I've noticed that a lot of my friends lately are INTJs and INFJs. It's funny, almost all of my friends are either INFJs or they're INTJs. The INTJs are interesting though because the introverted thinking and the INTJs extroverted thinking kind of get together to form this complete thinking package. And their extroverted thinking and your introverted thinking combine. And I find with my friend, it's like we can come up with a lot of things that we couldn't have come up with together and that's really hard to explain that, but it feels like a completely thought out thought in the end, after we sort of talk about something and work on a problem. So it's, that's something I've always really no noticed. And that's why I really like INTJs, even though I do find them a little bit dry in the feelings department sometimes, but I really enjoy the intellectual stimulation I get out of INTJs. All right, so the fourth cognitive function that INFJs have, and it's also the inferior function, is extroverted sensing. And extroverted sensing and introverted intuition kind of go together. It seems like those two are always together. But it's basically just looking around and seeing things around you, observing things. That's extroverted sensing. Um, I think, you know, it's a little confusing to me, to be honest, what this inferior function really means. It means, like, if you're really focusing and you've developed your extroverted sensing, you can be decent at it. Uh, definitely not as good as if it was your dominant function. But you know, if you don't put effort into it and develop it, or if you're tired, that's another thing I find. If I'm tired, I can't find my keys. I don't know where I put them. You know, where's my phone? I'm not sure. If I'm looking for something, I have to look in the same cupboard. I look everywhere I don't, and I don't find it. So then I look again everywhere, I don't find it. I look a third time everywhere, every cupboard, every drawer where it might be. And then all of a sudden I find it in a cupboard or a drawer that I've already looked two or three times. It, it, it's infuriating to me. It's like I can't see it. I can't see it. And I attribute that to weak extroverted sensing. Or maybe just when I'm tired or maybe that's what the inferior aspect of it means. But um, yeah, basically you miss things that are right in front of your eyes. And I think a lot of times INFJs 
Oh, I know I am. I'm often just completely lost in thought. I'm philosophizing about things all the time. I'm interested in psychology. I'm thinking about people and why they're doing certain things. I'm just like stuck in that, that it's like the last thing I want to do right now is like think about something that's in the here and now. And that is extroverted sensing. It's like looking and seeing, oh, that is dirty. Let me clean that. It's like living in the moment. So I suspect that that's why INFGs, it's considered this inferior function. It's something that we can do if we put our mind to it, but maybe it's uh, an area for improvement. That is for sure. I think one of the dichotomies of myself is I can come across super confident, while at the same time I'm super self-conscious. And I have a couple INFJ friends now. Uh, they're not easy to find or easy to get to know. It can take years. But once we're actually friends, the, the connection is really deep. And I've noticed that when I first meet another INFJ, they can come across as a bit mysterious and almost like they, they're confident. And they really, I'm thinking of one friend, so I do a lot of rock climbing. And she's, when I remember the first time I saw her in the gym, she just seemed so... I was almost intimidated of her. She seemed so strong and like commanding. And the funny thing is, is she, she suffers from a lot of performance anxiety. So inside she's really self-conscious. So on the outside she has this strong demeanor, but self-conscious on the inside. It's, it's, it is sort of funny how that works. And that's why I think we're susceptible to shame. And I think one of the worst things that anybody can do to an INFJ is shame them. Um, because it's like, I feel like I respond in one of two ways to shamings. If I, if I disagree with it, if somebody basically tries to shame me for something that I think is stupid or I don't agree with, I can just turn into this, like, it almost like a bit of like righteous rage can come out and I can argue until the ends of the earth and I will destroy that argument. And that is my goal. Um, and it's, it's can come out, come across really strong. And then when that comes out, sometimes, especially people who aren't really good at debating can get pretty freaked out and not, and be a little surprised because they're like, Whoa, I didn't realize this person was so scary. <laughs> but then another response to being shamed is if it's something that you subtly agree about you can just go into this place of complete self-consciousness and almost just want to go into a room, close the door, curl up in a ball, and never come out. And when that happens to me, that is horrible. And so when somebody shames me, it can, be, it can have some hugely damaging results. And basically, I don't like that person very much anymore. <laughs> A lot of times I can assume that everybody doesn't like me. I can start assuming you get, you get super paranoid and it's not healthy to be in that place. You start assuming people don't like you pushing, you know, thoughts and assumptions onto other people. And in the end they might be like, Hey, stop doing that. Like stop assuming that I don't like you. Like I, I've actually had friends say, stop doing that. I like you. And if you keep doing that, I'm going to get sick of it. Like, stop doing that. Stop pushing your bad image of yourself onto me and making me, making me almost seem like I'm saying that to you. So that's interesting. Never shame an INFJ. Unless you're trying to hurt them, I guess. But, you know, you just got to be careful because if you shame them about something they don't agree with, they're going to go into fight mode. So in this video, I sort of also wanted to talk a little bit about the weaknesses of INFJs and not just talk about the positives all the time. You know, because we're, we can get paranoid about people, we can do these things called loyalty checks. This is something we've got to watch out for. All of a sudden, you start to suspect that this person isn't your friend or you don't trust this person, so you do a test. You do a test to see. It's almost like pushing somebody off a cliff to see if they'll climb back up. That's what a loyalty test is, and it's... I don't know, I've done them. And it feels good when somebody passes the test because all of a sudden the trust goes up. But it's not the right thing to do. It's not a good way to do it. So one thing I want to talk about is I talked a little bit about before is this whole we're susceptible to being guilted. And part of that 
is we're susceptible to manipulation. Because if there's guilt involved, so some people, especially like narcissists or people like that, that really know how to manipulate and, and inject little bits of guilt, is that they can end up controlling you with guilt. So INFJs, I've seen this over and over and over, can often end up with narcissists. Because um, INFJs at their core have really strong empathy. Narcissists feed off empathy. And in a lot of ways, narcissism is almost the opposite of empathy. So narcissists often end up with empathetic people. INFJs often end up with narcissists. And I've seen it multiple times with friends. Um, and I think it's because the narcissist feeds on the caring. The thing is they almost control the INFJ or control the empathetic person, I should say, with manipulation and subtle guilt injections. It's like, oh, you're not doing this good enough. And the person's like, oh, well, I want to be helpful. I want to be valued. So then they start doing it. And then it happens more and more. And then before long, this, this poor person just realizes they're just living their life to satisfy this other person. And it becomes super unhealthy. And um, all of a sudden that door slam can happen if they realize it. So that is one thing to watch out for, for sure is you don't want to let yourself be manipulated. You gotta, you gotta be strong. You gotta be your own person and not let other, and not do things just to please people. And that has been the biggest struggle my whole life. Do not do things. I will put my own work aside to do other people's work just to make them feel better. I'm like, say I got a whole bunch of work I got to do for my own business. And then somebody's like, hey, I could really use my good, you know, a friend, I could really use this video. It would really help me, you know, market my own business. Oh, I just, I really need some help. I can't afford it. I'm, I'm really having a hard time. And you're like, yes, I want to help you. And then you put aside all your own work to now start doing their work. You know, it's great if you have the time or, you know, it's really good, I think, for us INFJs too donate our time now and then and to help people but it can go too far to the point of being abused and so oftentimes us INFJs if you talk to any INFJ they usually got some story about how somebody abused their time abused their empathy abused their willingness to help so definitely something to watch out for so as an INFJ one thing I've noticed it's important the people that I hang out with. And there's a few things that I just really need out of people, otherwise it doesn't work well. And so I need honesty. Uh, I've really noticed that if I, I mean, it's not, I think that's the other thing is when you have this extroverted feeling and the introverted intuition combined, you can tell when people are lying, it is super easy. So if you're an INFJ, you'll know what I'm talking about. You're just reading, you're sitting there reading the person and you're like, this is not adding up your intuition. You get this gut feeling like this person's lying to me. I do not trust a word this thing. I do not trust a word this person's saying. It's, it's almost like a sixth sense when you combine that extroverted feeling with the introverted intuition. And I think that's why a lot of times INFJs end up in situations or jobs where they can read people. So, you know, I think INFJs can be in multiple different jobs. They can be in jobs where they think a lot and they really uh, capitalize on that introverted thinking and the introverted in intuition. And it's sort of like finding that path within all this data and all this noise, uh, really complex systems. You know, we can really work within that. Um, but oftentimes, you know, you know, the best counselors are often INFJs because good at reading people. So communication is also really important to me. I need deep connections to feel like I even have a relationship with somebody. A lot of people, they're like, oh, my friend so-and-so, and then they've talked five times. Like That to me isn't a friend. A friend is a deep connection, somebody that I almost share emotional intimacy with. And what is emotional intimacy? It's somebody that I can tell anything to. I can tell them stuff, and I know it's a safe place. I feel understood understanding is just so important to me and it's something that I've really noticed more as I've gotten older. INFJ, I mean, you got to find those kind of relationships. It is super important for your own sanity to feel understood. Those are the people we often end up with and we do not feel un understood. We we feel like what is wrong with this relationship? I just can't get through this person. Why won't they want to talk to me? Why can't I 
I mean, and you feel like you're dying inside because it's like you can't force somebody to understand. You can't teach somebody to understand you. You can't teach somebody to want to understand, maybe. That's what I'm saying. All right. So the last thing here that really, last thing that really matters is authenticity. Authenticity is the key for me. I need people in my life. I need it for myself. I need to be authentic. And sometimes being authentic, I've realized, goes against culture. It goes against other things that people think you should be doing. And that's where it gets hard. If you actually, what, what do you do when it comes down to a choice between authenticity and loyalty, for example? I think that's one of the toughest situations that I've been in. You know, do I, do I, okay, so I'm loyal. Do I act loyal or do I be authentic? And, you know, we value loyalty too. I really value loyalty. But, you know, what? I think I value authenticity more than loyalty. I can't do something if I'm not being true to myself, if it goes against my, it's that sandpaper feeling. And that's what it is. If it, if it makes me feel like, oh, this is wrong, this is dirty, I need to fix this. I have a really hard time operating in that environment. I need to get out. I need to be authentic. The other thing is I need to be around people that are authentic. If people are liars or shifty or shady, I mean, that just doesn't work. I, I can't be around those people. All right, so that's my INFJ video. I feel like this ended up being way longer than I meant it to be. Anyway, I'm sure there's lots more to say. I'm sure I said too much on certain things. But I hope that's sort of a general overview on me and what I think of this INFJ personality. I think the one thing I want to emphasize at the end here is I think it's really important to not use it as an excuse. It's just a model to describe certain behavior. It's to, it, The way I use it is to help me find my weaknesses so I can work on them. It is not a reason to ignore your weaknesses. Oh, INFJs are bad at this, therefore I'm not doing it. That's that's garbage. Though You should actually be going, INFJs are bad at this, therefore I'm gonna work on that. Because really, what is a personality? It's just the things that you're innately good at. It's the things that you're good at without trying. But that doesn't mean you can't work on your weaknesses and actually become really good at those things. Long video. I hope you got something out of it. If you've made it this far, I'm impressed. You probably are an INFJ if you made it this far. Otherwise, a lot of the other types would have given up by now, I bet. Anyway, guys, have a great day. Thanks for watching. See you later.